Hello everyone. So yes, I'm the lucky guy that has uh, the, the chance to work uh, every day with uh, talented uh, engineers to uh, expand, uh, to develop, to deliver uh, the Tezos uh, roadmap. Um, uh, oh, that's the way I will change the slide, I suppose. Um, so actually, um, you, you have seen uh, this morning uh, already everything I had to say during my talk. <laughs> it has been, uh, uh, yeah, I could stop here. <laughs> it has been said in uh, something like uh, six minutes. I, I, I use my phone. I, by Arthur, uh, he describes the entire roadmap for Tezos X and uh, in a very uh, precise and uh, I think clear way. So, <laughs> I will do what uh, we'll do at Core Engineering. I will uh, expand Arthur's uh, vision and exp explanations so that we all have the time to really understand the, the details. But at least there is one question, one topic that, has, that is for sure in all your minds and that has not been discussed this morning. So let me try to move to the next slide. Mm here. Why X? Why Tezos X? So I suppose you may have uh, uh, built some explanations in your, in your mind. Uh, actually, when this was revealed to engineers, uh, is, this has created a lot of uh, reactions uh, for, uh, from engineers. Uh, you know, there are some French people, so they have this uh, critical thinking uh, deep uh, in their uh, in their brain, and uh, for some of them, they say, oh, I don't like this letter, it's disgusting, okay? Uh, for, for others, it was like, uh, oh, X, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an unknown, it's, uh, it's a problem to solve, it's a mathematic problem, it's an equation. So, well, at least people talk about X, so Tezos X is already a good name for that. But for, I, I like this name, personally, uh, especially because it's, uh, it's consistent with exactly where we are for Tezos in our scaling journey. Okay? Because the main uh, thing that we need to do now is to expand. So X expand is something that I make this association in my mind. Expand because, as uh, Asad said uh, to us uh, this morning, what uh, uh, we, we want to do is actually to create an abundance of transactions to have better performance to that, uh, to that end. We want to offer more choices to all users everywhere in the world. And this is what interoperability is about. And finally, we want to create more opportunities for our users. And that's exactly what composability is about. So these three uh, words, I will try to explain them to you today so that you can come back to your dinner with uh, your family and people you, you want to. To, to I, I don't know, to feel uh, proud, bright in front of them, so that you, you'll be able to explain to what all this is about, okay? Um, so, um, what I want you to, uh, to understand is that actually the roadmap to Tezos X has already started. It's not as if we started Tezos X today from scratch. We do have already a lot of Tezos X in place. This is what we call this uh, modulitic uh, mainnet, so uh, a neologism, so a new word uh, that we have uh, invented to, uh, to explain the specificity of our uh, mainnet. But the point is to, to, to take this, what we have today, into something completely new, so a blockchain that will provide a cloud-like uh, experience to our users. Okay? So that, that will be the journey of this, uh, of this talk. Uh, and I will start with uh, just coming back to this modulitic word, what it means. It's, it's actually a uh, uh, an aggregation of two words, modular and monolithic. So modularity is something that you all, uh, you all know, actually. It's a very old idea. When you have a complex problem, either you try to tackle it with uh, your brain and you spend a lot of energy, or you decompose it into sub-problems that are easier to solve in isolation, and then you compose the solution and you get the answer of the big problem that you had. So that's exactly modularity. It's a, it's a very basic uh, 
principle of uh, software engineering, it's about separation of concerns. When you have too much complexity in a problem, you need to simplify it. Okay, so that's, that's what uh, this is about. So it's really turning, in terms of blockchain, three concerns that the blockchain need to, uh, uh, to, to, to solve, uh, the settlement, the publication, and the execution into three different layers that will tackle each problem independently. Okay? That way, you can actually uh, uh, decouple each steps, each aspect of the problem, and uh, be, uh, go, actually go uh, uh, really further. But we are also unique in this uh, modular blockchain approach because we want to keep the whole system monolithic. What does that mean? It means that we are not here to offer, let's say, uh, the DAL to other blockchains or to offer our smart rollups to other blockchains. Why it's not that we are not generous? We are, of course. But what we want is actually to keep enough uh, flexibility to build the best product, to actually better understand what is a good stack for a, a good software stack for, um, for a blockchain to be useful for four kinds of users, bakers, operators, op um, builders, and, and, and users. It's super complicated to actually understand how everything should fit together to provide the best user experience. So it's not the right moment to define uh, standards that will allow competitors to work together on a, on a modular stack. It's, uh, it's too early. For us, what is really important is to better understand how to make a blockchain a really usable product. And for this, you need to keep the interfaces sufficiently uh, flexible to change, to pivot very quickly to understand and adapt continuously, okay? So, continuous adaptation is exactly what Tezos is about from the beginning. It's our, in our DNA, 16 upgrades in, in six years, that's huge. It has been done with on-chain governance, not uh, with art forks, really focusing on uh, making sure that each step is backed up by the community, but by our bakers. So we are really taking centralization seriously because we think that's the only way to be trustable as a, an infrastructure for the whole planet to use to, for asset management. Recently, we had this uh, very uh, uh, important and large upgrade, the Paris one. It was quite an adventure, but it came with uh, three very important new features. Reduction of block time to 10 seconds, the activation of the DAL, I will come back on it, and also adaptive issues, um, a new way to, uh, to, to have our crypto economic find dynamically the good balance between security and inflation. So layer one is great, but if you keep all the concerns of settlement, publication, and execution in this layer, it's a nightmare. It's very difficult to both allow anyone with a Raspberry Pi to participate and also allow, let's say, one million TPS to, to, to be processed by this machinery. It's, I won't say it's impossible, I don't know, I have, don't have a proof of that, but I know it's quite difficult. So, how to expand? Well, as you know, one first step that we have made in uh, last year is introduction of enshrined smart rollups. We talked so, so much about it <laughs> during the last year, I don't know if I, I want to to again uh, tell you how, how beautiful they are, but I will do it nonetheless. <laughs> so, optimistic rollups in Tezos, they are uh, permissionless with an open fraud system. Anyone can defend the, the, um, the rollup, the assets on the rollup. They are very efficient thanks to uh, being enshrined. We have a lot of nice features like the shared inbox, like uh, 
a, a bidirectional bridge with the L1. And um, all this allow you to actually extend the computational power of Tezos at will. If you want to have more resources on Tezos today, you just have to, uh, to, to um, create a new rollup. Okay? It's just, just like this. You come with your resources and you plug it, and that's it. You have more TPS. And we have shown that actually, one million TPS with 1,000 rollups running at uh, 1,000 TPS is perfectly uh, possible on Tezos. So, and th that's what is called horizontal scalability, you know? So, this ability to add more, uh, more and more rollups, more and more CPUs, if you want, on the system, and you get more and more capacity. So, that way, we have removed the execution from the layer one, and it's, uh, it's a relief because we don't have to uh, target uh, as many performance uh, at the execution level, at least, for, for layer one. But that's not uh, sufficient. The, oh, no, that's not the right one. Ah, yes. So the, the other ingredient that is super important for, uh, for scalability to work is a data availability layer. So we said several times that it's a, it's a booster for uh, smart rollups. Why? Because it allows smart rollups to run at full, full, full speed. With a data availability layer that is just, uh, um, le le um, let's picture it as a, 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 new in, a new source of data in your, in your system that is not uh, limited by the block size. So it's, it's a new source and it's a scalable bandwidth. Again, the more you add uh, um, participant to the DAL, the larger the band bandwidth is. So, uh, I've, so we, we have been uh, at uh, ETHCC uh, looking at uh, what uh, other blockchains are doing on, the, on their data availability layer. And actually, we have uh, been quite uh, proud <laughs> to see that uh, we have today on mainnet a bleeding edge uh, data availability layer that is able to deal with um, um, the, the most uh, important, probably, aspect that change everything, the ability to have a network where you don't have everyone to download everything. It's super important because that's the only way to get um, an actual uh, elasticity of your network, this ability to add more nodes and by this process adding more bandwidth. So we are quite advanced uh, in terms of data availability. I will come back on this later. But what I want you to know is that we need backers to participate. It has already been said by Arthur previously, but let me repeat it once now. I will repeat it later in my talk. We need your backers to run a DAL node. It's super important because that's the only way to get the, the DAL working. But I will come back on that. Okay, so you have uh, two very nice ingredients to get uh, scalability. You need to do a recipe, okay? And this recipe is uh, Etherlink on Tezos. Again, uh, you have heard about it many times, but let me remind you that it's, it's an EVM compatible wallop that is more or less uh, an equivalent of Arbitrum 1. It provides a low latency, very low uh, transaction cost. Um, but it is also non-custodial, which means that there is no specific actor that is able to, uh, to have a privileged operation on the roll-up. It means that uh, um, it's actually the, the Tezos baker, the Tezos community, that decides what will be the next upgrade, what, uh, what is the operator of the sequencer. So they actually control as a community level, what is going on on this, uh, on this layer two. Um, and very soon, uh, you will see in the, in the sequence uh, this ability to have a, uh, a protection against uh, um, MEV. So it's uh, basically the idea that uh, the sequencer itself will, have, will have, have no mean 
to reorder the transaction in order to get profit from you. So more or less, it means that uh, your transactions are safe, your assets are safe, and nobody will try to, to be in the middle to, to gain some money over you. All right. So that's our modulitic mainnet. Okay? So it's a, it's a modular architecture with a well-thought global design in order to get uh, more and more from Tezos. So actually, uh, the, as I've said previously, the seed of Tezos X is already here. Okay? So what's next? What is the nat natural uh, consequences, natural next step? is simply to expand. So you can, you can see if you, I don't know if you, you did that uh, when you were uh, uh, little, take a, a seed and cut it in half, you look inside and you can see that everything is here. The, every part of the plant that will uh, grow is here. So it's exactly that. In the current architecture, we have everything to grow and we just have now to iterate, 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 to continuously evolve and get to this uh, Tezos X vision. So what does that mean? What's gon what are we going to do in the next uh, iteration of this process? First, we'll expand performances. If uh, we have uh, an abundance of transactions, what we get from a user perspective is a predictability of cost. It means that there's no more an issue to you just don't think about the cost of your transactions. It won't change significantly. It won't have an impact on your business. You can invest on Tezos because you know it will be uh, future-proof. In order to achieve that, we have uh, many uh, actions, <laughs> many work, a lot of work. First one is uh, the Risk V uh, experiments. So. Um, you probably know that uh, we are currently using WebAssembly, WASM, as the runtime, the, the actual, uh, let's say, hardware that uh, runs, uh, that executes uh, the rollups. Um, it was, I think it's a, it's, it was a perfectly good choice. Uh, the execution is quite fast. We are using WASMer, so it's a JIT-based execution platform that goes uh, quite fast. Wasm is a good target if you, uh, if you uh, are programming in Rust, in Go, in C++. So well, it's, uh, it's very usable, very, very nice. Um, but when we designed smart rollups, we, didn't, we weren't sure exactly that Wasm was exactly the right VM to target. So we have made the design modular. We have made sure that in the future, we would be able to move to another execution platform if needed. So, we technically, what it means is that in the code, you have a notion, a concept of proof generating virtual machines, and all the system is defined uh, as a, um, a function of, of, uh, of PVMs. So you can change the PVM and you get you still get the same properties. You don't have to redo the fraud proof system of, or, of, or whatever. So that's a modular design. And we are currently exploring uh, the usage of uh, 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 a low level PVM, a lower level PVM based on the Risk V architecture in order to, uh, to fix some issues that we have found in Wasm that are quite technical. So Arthur explained them this morning, but the idea is that it's, it's so WASM is a, is a PVM that is a, a bit uh, high level. Uh, it's difficult to interrupt it. It's difficult to actually build a, a, res, a resource model, a cost model on it. And um, we have found ways, of course, but it's not very convenient for, uh, for the future. So, and also it is adding uh, overhead. So we, we might get more performances if we move to um, a, a lower level uh, and better understood uh, hardware in terms of, uh, of cost. Also, uh, Wasm is still too restrictive for us. We want a universal machine. We want something that can run anything. So, Wasm 
doesn't allow you, for instance, to generate code at runtime. So it means that if you have, let's say, a JavaScript runtime that is very efficient and generates code dynamically, you cannot use it. And people will complain, of course. Um, also, maybe you will have some libraries that won't be compatible with Wasm, with the tool chain that target Wasm. So we have decided to invest in RISC V, and we'll see if we manage to uh, replace Wasm with this uh, backend. Data availability layer. We have shipped the version in, uh, in Paris. It's activated, it's running. Again, we need you to run downloads. Um, but for the moment, it's, a, it's an opt-in participation. You are not forced as a baker to participate. So something that we'll do uh, in the future is to actually make this a mandatory part of the Tezos infra infrastructure. If you want to participate to the infrastructure, we need you also to, uh, to run a download. But we, want, uh, we wanted the bakers to have enough time to uh, set up their, inf their new infrastructure. Um, so uh, that's why it's opt-in for the moment. But um, keep in mind that for security reason, we need two thirds of the stake at least uh, to actually participate in, the, in, in this uh, DAL network unless it doesn't exist at all. It doesn't run at all, it's deactivated. It is not, just not usable. So if we want to keep the bandwidth of uh, the Tezos network high, we need a certainty, let's say uh, 70, 80% of the stake actually running a DAL node. So that will be uh, quite a challenge in the future to get there, but uh, we, we do whatever it takes. Um, so our goal is uh, then to use the scalability of, uh, of the DAR to increase the bandwidth progressively. And uh, in Tezos X, the vision is to get a 100 megabyte per second uh, network, a bandwidth in the, in the network. So it should be an abundance of, uh, of, of bandwidth uh, for, this, uh, for this blockchain. Another very important um, leverage to get performances is parallelization. I don't know if you have understood the horizontal scaling vs vertical scaling this morning, but I will come back on it. So for, for a long time, and, and probably uh, also for many people, uh, today in the industry, rollups are about horizontal scaling. As I've said, okay, if you want more resources, just add your rollup, come with your, your, your resources, and uh, then you get more TPS. But what we have noticed is that actually, given the security assumption of rollups, the fact that you only need one honest operator to care about your rollup, actually, what you can do is to ask this operator to be a, a bit rich, but to actually have a very, very efficient machine to run the rollup. So, so I've put here a, a supercomputer. So it's a several millions machine. Maybe we won't go exactly to that, uh, <laughs> to that level, but you can imagine using, let's say, a, um, a, a, a machine on GCP with uh, several hundreds of core, it will cost you uh, maybe uh, $1,000 per, per month. But if uh, it's about dealing with the whole uh, Tezos uh, uh, ecosystem, it's, it's not that expensive, okay? So we will continue to let anyone that has a, interest in, the, in terms of assets in, in, in our infrastructure to be able to run, but it will be a bit more costly, and that's fine from a security point of view. So that's um, why we can perfectly have um, a very strong machine running the rollup, and in this uh, very strong machine, you will get very, very, uh, very large numbers of, of CPUs. So the, the thing that we will push as a one of the next steps to get more performances is actually to be able to spawn many runtimes inside these uh, very large rollups so that you can more or less use one CPU to run one runtime. So you will have 
hundreds of runtimes running in parallel. So you can imagine that uh, inside this rollup, more or less, you will have uh, several chains, several zones where things will be run in parallel. And I'm pretty sure you can picture that it's a, it's a very, very good uh, leverage to get more performances. And if you keep that in mind, one million TPS in a single rollup doesn't seem that uh, crazy. It's probably feasible, and uh, that's our, our goal. Okay. So that's it for performances. So let me talk now about uh, interoperability. So what interoperability is about, it's, it's really about openness. It's about keeping more choices possible to, uh, to developers. So if you allow anyone to, um, to come with uh, its own tool chain, its own stack, its own legacy, and you say, no, no, it won't cost you that much in terms of development cost to integrate Tezos in your stack or the other way around, then you will probably be heard and, and get more builders. That's the strategy that we are trying to push here with Tezos X. What does that mean uh, concretely in terms of engineering? I don't know if there are here people uh, targeting uh, Mikkelsen. Uh, please uh, raise your hand. Okay. I, I have uh, seen some people looking at Etherlink like this with some, you know, jealousy in, the, in their eyes. Like, okay, but uh, we have this uh, 10 second latency. They have. Uh, 500 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds. Uh, we have the cost of the layer one, which is, we, which is quite cheap, but uh, they seem a bit cheaper. Okay, you're jealous, that's normal. And we are working to, uh, to, to, to help you migrate from, uh, no, I don't, yes, uh, from the layer one. So your D app will be able to migrate from the layer one to the layer two because we will soon introduce a new runtime run that will transparently reproduce a Tezos execution environment on the layer two. So magically, thanks to that, you will get the same USPs as uh, uh, the same um, advantage as uh, Etherlink, uh, low latency, MEV protection, ultra low, ultra low cost. That's a dream, right? But it's also a dream for core developers, to be honest, because when we'll be able to more or less deprecate the layer one as an execution platform, it will take some time, of course, because we don't want to force anyone to, to migrate. When we'll be in this uh, situation, we'll be able to go further and clean and uh, simplify and get to this lightweight layer one that will be able to do uh, even more uh, efficiently the consensus about uh, uh, what, what's going on in the chain, okay? So that's um, quite an, uh, an exciting uh, project. It's called Teslink for the moment. It's a code name. Yeah, I think I find it uh, quite uh, nice, but uh, we'll see if we keep it. But we don't have to stop here. It's, I mean, the number of uh, so, uh, Mikkelsen developers, the number of EVM developers, it's a, a, a grain of, uh, of uh, salt if you compare it to JavaScript developers. Okay, there are millions of JavaScript developers. So our next step, or actually it's done in parallel to be, to be frank, is to um, introduce justice. Justice is a runtime, just like uh, Etherlink and, and Mikkelsen. But that is focus, focusing on a, a, a very clear objective to make all the tool chains, the idioms, everything that is natural for a JavaScript developer to develop a software sa stack, uh, exactly uh, the same on Tezos. So they will feel like home with uh, justice. Oh, I can reuse exactly the, the same tools. Oh, it's. Uh, 
the API I was looking for, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So justice is about that. It's about creating the best developer experience with respect to um, uh, uh, smart contracts development in JavaScript, and um, and that's uh, also quite uh, exciting. But of course, we won't stop here. What we want is not only that uh, JavaScript developer will feel home. We want any developers in the world to feel like home when deploying on Tezos. So again, it's just uh, uh, the interoperability that we will push to uh, the maximum possible uh, one um, in our canonical rollup that will allow any dev to deploy on Tezos with absolutely no development cost. That's our goal. So for instance, if you're JavaScript, if you're uh, .NET, if you're Python, Java, we'll find a runtime for you to execute your application. Finally, there is a, a third technical word that you, you, you remember. You need to, uh, to keep it in mind to, to tell others that uh, you have understood this very technical thing that was uh, at the very edge of what uh, people can do in blockchain, okay? So, composability. Okay, composability is about creating more opportunities. The idea is that we, want, we, we don't want people just to deploy their dApp. We want their dApp to actually live in a world of, with other dApps, just with the uh, ability to move assets around from uh, one D up to the other. We really want interactions. We want composability between, uh, between services. So that's what uh, composability is about. And obviously, it should create more values for our users, since more opportunities creates more uh, uh, economical uh, uh, possibilities, of course. First step, well, we have many runtimes in our, uh, in our canonical rollup. There is nothing that prevents us to implement a bridge inside the rollup. So a bridge that will allow assets to move from one runtime to the other inside the rollup. So it means that it will be fast because it will be done at the pace of L2 blocks production. So every, uh, let's say, 200 milliseconds, you will have an asset moving from here to there. It's super fast. And it will also be safe because it's simply just continuing with the same security assumptions. The canonical rollups is working as intended and can be defended if someone is trying to, to do some dishonest actions on it. So it's very simple answer to the problem of moving assets around between a lot of different D apps. And, uh, and uh, that's actually something that is not difficult technically and uh, can be done uh, probably easily. Uh, don't hate me, core developers, if you are here. But there is a, a, a piece that will probably be needed in this uh, canonical rollup. It will be what is called today uh, smart accounting. It's uh, this idea that uh, actually if your sets are uh, spread everywhere in many D apps, in some maybe a buffer uh, waiting for some operations to be validated, etc. The, the, the state of your wallet is more or less quite a mess, quite, quite a, a, a complex, in a complex state, okay? So you need a, a, um, an actual program to take care of, uh, of your wallet on chain. So that's one idea behind uh, smart accounting and that's probably be a, a priority for the usability of our uh, canonical rollup in the future. I don't know if you have uh, followed closely the discussions we had between uh, all these uh, very clever people talking about bridging, atomicity, etc. It was uh, quite technical. I've followed, it's my job, that's my expertise, but I don't know if you were able to do so. It, it, I should say that at some point, I had some troubles. Anyway, um, what, import what is important is that if you have this model of uh, um, moving assets 
at the boundaries of L2 blocks. Sometimes for uh, some very important uh, DeFi typically uh, operations, you need you, you cannot afford this uh, latency, even if, it's, it, if it, it is quite fast. If you have several operations to do in a, in a sequence, it's probably too, too slow. You may have someone in between that will break the assumptions and your trade uh, won't uh, go to the end. For this reason, the step after the uh, introduction of a fast and safe internal bridge will probably be introduction of uh, some atomicity that needs to be well, uh, well designed, well understood, uh, in order to allow for, uh, for this, that kind of typical uh, DeFi usage to provide this atomicity that people are looking for. When we, we will do that, we'll move to a world of uh, full parallelization that is super easy to implement. Again, uh, core developers don't hate me. Uh, to a world where uh, actually we move to uh, what is called concurrency in computer science. So a world where the, you have processes that interact and then uh, we'll have to be uh, very careful, especially in a blockchain system because we can have some uh, security issues, some attack surface introduced by that kind of, uh, of elements. Anyway, that's our goal and we'll try to, uh, to reach it. If we go there, if we do everything, what we get in the end is something that really matches what a builder is experiencing when uh, he's interacting with AWS or GCP. As a builder, why do you use a cloud? It's easy, it's because you don't have at home in your, uh, you know, your Raspberry Pi running on your uh, internet connection, the capacity to provide the best services the best infrastructure with uh, reliability that is, that is uh, 99.99999% uh, uptime. You, you don't have uh, elasticity, the possibility to add more uh, machines when needed or to reduce the amount of machine used when uh, the, the activity is, uh, is decreasing, etc., etc. So, and also, you don't have the, net, the same network bandwidth. Etc. So, as a builder, when I deploy on GCP, that's uh, the reason why I, I use it. And I, it, it's, it will be exactly the same when people will, dev, uh, will deploy on Tezos X, because they will be looking for um, so uh, a, a, a runtime. So some machine, a machine pool, exactly like in a cloud that uh, allows some elasticity, some um, close match between the need of resources and the actual paid resources. Uh, they will also be uh, super happy to, to get uh, a very secure asset management, that's uh, the business value of uh, blockchain, okay? And, uh, yeah, it, it means that uh, the payment, the identity will be uh, managed on the blockchain, and if the data center burns, and that happens in France not uh, so long ago, maybe uh, two years ago, OV, OVH uh, has one big building that has burned, uh, and a lot, a lot of uh, actual uh, services were uh, in trouble, let's say. With a blockchain, you get a decentralized network, so something that is resistant to that kind of uh, incident. It's almost the end of the talk, okay? So let's uh, stop a bit. Okay, interoperability, performances, composability. I hope you all understand now and you are able to tell your friends. What uh, you can take home? Well, the Tezos X is about take. It's it's actually a roadmap, and we are. I, I don't know exactly where, but uh, we have made a long a long run already, and we have a lot of things to do. But it's really about turning our modulitic mainnet into uh, a blockchain with uh, uh, a cloud-like experience. Okay, so I. 
It's, it's a short message. I think it's very clear. It's clear that uh, it's already there. And uh, as usual, it will keep evolving because that's exactly the DNA of Tezos. We will do continuously more and more innovations. And uh, I think and I hope that now, if you look back to the roadmap diagram, it is quite uh, complex. You should be able to go to any part of it and uh, actually um, uh, use it to explain it to your, uh, I don't know, father-in-law or someone like that. If you need some help, there is here a QR code pointing to the uh, blog post describing the roadmap of Tezos X. And uh, I can also take some questions right now. Thank you. Hello, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what's gonna happen with the governance of the canonical rollup? Um, so the, the governance will be exactly the same as uh, Etherlink. So it will be the governance, uh, um, more or less a replication of the governance of Tezos on L1 done by Bakers. So it's exactly the same as the selling. Awesome, awesome. And another question. Uh, when you talked about the migration from, uh, for dApps from the layer one to the layer two to the canonical rollup about Tezos dApps. Um, so basically, if I understand it correctly, let's say we will have object migrate to the L2 and people will be able to connect with even EVM wallets and other wallets from Rust and so on. Will, uh, will they all be connected like that? So you're you are asking a question that is a bit beyond the core engineering, but yeah, I can yeah. answer it. Uh, indeed, uh, it will be of, uh, I mean, all of this is a back end. Mm -hmm. okay? And uh, really the front end, what will make the actual uh, end user uh, experience will be uh, essential. Huh? So to that end, we'll probably need a, a, a wallet with superpowers, the ability to interact with uh, this smart accounting or something that uh, really displays the assets, hiding to end users the existence of many runtimes that don't really care. What they want to know is uh, which the apps they are using, where are their assets, and how to move them around. Great, great. And last, just to confirm, uh, regarding the new PVM, which will be uh, you're working on, like uh, Risk Five, this will replace the previous WASM, or they will coexist. They will coexist. They there will is no, coexist. The, the system is able to handle uh, many. Right. In the canonical rollup, we, we, our target is to use uh, Risk Five mm -hmm. because it, it will make uh, uh, possible uh, um, the implementation of far many, uh, far, yeah, More a lo lot of uh, runtimes. Mm -hmm. While with Wasm, it's really too complicated. Great. That's all. Thank you. Welcome. So on the canonical rollup, how complicated will it be to add a new runtime? Say we wanted to add support for a programming language that core engineering is not planning on adding and maintain it, or help maintain it. Is that a large undertaking? So we didn't think about that uh, before, but uh, the, so it will really depends on some uh, design uh, aspect, but the idea is that uh, um, there is a clear separation in, uh, in our smart rollups between the, the smart rollup engine that is in the protocol, and uh, that's protocol code, so it's, it's quite uh, critical. And um, what we call the kernel. So kernel are uh, this program that actually defines the lo business logic of, of the smart rollups. And uh, the idea of the canonical rollup is actually to, to implement a kernel that will look like an hypervisor or uh, it will be a, we will have a middleware that will more or less schedule, let's say, uh, or um, I mean, be able to handle as many runtimes as we want. And uh, then we could, I mean, we are open source, we are accepting uh, uh, external contributions, so we could think of uh, an extension of the runtimes with uh, use, I mean, uh, runtimes coming from uh, anywhere. So it's technically, there is, I don't think there is a, 
something invisible. Uh, the, the only problem is to make sure that the code is, as usual, audited and uh, uh, of uh, good quality with no bugs in order to avoid uh, a complete uh, problem in the, in the canonical rollup. And as far as keeping one specific runtime maintained, like uh, programming language are always advancing, new versions coming out, do you have to go through the governance process to say update to a new version of the runtime? Yes. Thank you. Hey, Jan. <coughs> Hello. So um, <clears throat> there are several runtimes, Mickelson runtime, there's the EVM runtime, um, and then there's uh, runtimes all the way down. At the bottom is risk five. So does that mean that um, the, uh, the EVM runtime is going to be ported to risk five to run there, or? Um, actually, so currently we are using an EVM that is implemented in Rust. And uh, the Rust toolchain can be compiled to Risk Five, so there is no not much more to do. Okay, so the uh, the base runtime for all of these higher level runtimes is is always going to be Risk Five. For in the canonical rollup, probably it's not settled yet because we need to um, to to continue uh, this project and make sure that uh, we are able to get enough performances typically. But yes, that's the current plan. Okay, and um, this might be a naive question, but it's a question I don't know the answer to. Risk Five is a hardware runtime, so is there a, will there be a hardware requirement for validators to run these EVMs? Uh, or no, um, the choice of uh, Risk Five was really to f um, try to find a, um, an hardware existing hardware, so that is targeted by uh, two chains that is sufficiently well specified and simple to be implemented in a, in a critical software system. So, and by implementing, I mean, uh, we, had to we, we have implemented an emulator of RISC-V that can be run on uh, any other platform. But that's not enough to get performances. What you get is to generate native code f for the host a CPU that is executing the RISC-V code. And we have many, uh, are, that's not easy, but we have many um, tricks to try to get to a sufficiently fast hardware emulation on any uh, host. So in the future, when this all comes to pass, validators may have a choice to get sufficiently powerful hardware to run the emulator adequately, or uh, to actually run Risk V hardware. Um, I don't know. I think the more plausible, uh, at least for the short term, will be the first uh, situation where you are using a very fast um, x86 or uh, ARM, I don't know, software to run the emulator. This, this part will work uh, quickly. But we can imagine a future where uh, Actually, uh, Risk Five hardware will be sufficiently deterministic to uh, to run uh, to run kernels. It's um, it's a bit uh, science fiction, so I cannot uh, promise promise uh, that part. Okay, it's uh, either way exciting. Thank you, Jan. Thanks. <laughs>